and you can compare that to what you saw as you read it. Uh, but some things you want to pay attention to, uh, some literary terms, uh, point of view or narrative perspective. Who's your narrator? Uh, what point of view do they have? Is it limited? Is it omniscient? Is it past tense? Is it present tense? Is your narrator reliable or unreliable? Oh, great. Um, this is telling me my battery is low. So hopefully we're still recording. Um, my phone is an iPhone 6 and the battery um, dies really quickly and the, the cord doesn't connect very well. So bear with me here. Um, so as I was saying, point of view and narrative perspective. Who's your narrator? What what do they understand about the world? Are they are they limited or omniscient? Is it first or, or third person? Are we trapped behind one person's eyes or is the narrator sort of able to see everybody? Is it, is it an omniscient perspective? Does it know everything about everybody? These can help you in your diagnosis of the story. So that's useful to look at. Uh, selection of detail. What things does the author focus on and why? What are the, what are the details uh, that they're noticing uh, through their narrative perspective reveal about the characters, about the situation, about the conflict, about whatever it is that the prompt is asking for? Uh, so you can do a lot with selection of detail. Figurative language, anytime you see a metaphor, a simile, a paradox, an oxymoron, a personification, a hyperbole, a metonymy, any of those kinds of things, stop. Take a quick second and, and underline and identify it. Uh, what is the author doing there? That's that's useful. Tone. Uh, what kind of tone does the author take? Does the tone shift at any point? Um, you know, what does the tone reveal about the characters? Especially if the characters are talking, if there's dialogue or if there's a narrative point of view that is partial to a particular person, the tone that they take about their surroundings reveals a lot about the character and that's really useful information. Uh, symbolism. Is there any symbolism going on? Uh, if you see symbolism, identify it. Symbolism is almost always connected to themes. So if you can, if you can identify a symbol, maybe you can identify a theme. Uh, allegory, is it clearly two levels of meaning going on? That's rare, but if it happens and you find it, that's a gold mine. Uh, allusion, do you see allusions to the Bible? Do you see allusions to Greek mythology, um, to other works of literature that we've read? If you see some of those, those are, those are very useful to sort of mine and talk about as well. Um, as I said earlier, direct versus indirect characterization, uh, about 30% of these deal with characterization specifically. And so if you can identify that element, it will help you um, in your analysis. Uh, juxtaposition. A lot of times authors set things up so there are two paragraphs that almost talk to each other where they explore two different ideas. And if things are set up in juxtaposition like that, it's done so you as a reader can make some sort of a... Uh, judgment between those two things or understand the judgment that the author or the character feels between those two things. So juxtaposition is really useful to you. Um, dialogue, uh, pay attention to dialogue because even if the point of view doesn't shift, the dialogue is from the point of view of the character. And so you can gain some good knowledge about a character by paying attention to their dialogue and how it's used. Uh, inner monologues, another great tool. Uh, if a character doesn't say it out loud but thinks it in their head, that's very revealing about the character's ideas. Uh, but these are all terms that you can use in your essay. You're not going to use all of them. You're going to focus on the ones that you see. Uh, but I'm just trying to give you a list. Theme, you know, if you see some themes coming out, that's great. That's the home run. If you can get down to a theme at the end, that's wonderful. They're looking for that complexity and nuance and theme. Um, and then um, irony. Remember those three ironies. Uh, Verbal irony, situational irony, and dramatic irony. Um, but if you see anything that's ironic, uh, that's that's usually something that's useful to analyze as well. Why is the author making it ironic? What is the purpose of this irony? What what does it teach us? Uh, so these are all the kinds of things you want to ask and think about as you read the excerpt. So let's read the excerpt. I'm going to read the question to you one more time just to get it fresh in your minds, and then I'm going to read the excerpt and I'll I'll give you whatever I can find in it. And then what we'll do is we'll go online. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop the link when I post this on the web page or on the classroom page. But I'll give you the link to the AP Classroom where you can go and you can look at the released answers to this particular question. And we'll read those three answers and we'll look at what those authors did and we'll see what they scored. And um, hopefully that'll give you a sense of how other students your age with your ability levels are answering these questions and which ones score well and which ones don't score well and, and why. And that'll help you as you go to write your next timed writing as well. So, um, the following passage is from D.H. Lawrence's 1915 novel, The Rainbow, which focuses on the lives of the Brangwins, a farming family who lived in rural England during the late 19th century. 
Read the passage carefully. Annotate. Then write an essay in which you analyze how Lawrence, the author, employs literary devices to characterize the woman and capture her situation. So how do the devices used by Lawrence characterize the woman, capture her situation? It was enough for the men. I'm, I'm just gonna, let me read the whole thing through and then we'll read the whole thing through a second time. This is how I would do it. I would just read it once, just to read it and understand the passage. I would skim it real quick and then I would go through and do my real annotation. It was enough for the men that the earth heaved and opened its furrow to them, that the wind blew dry, the wet wheat, and set the young ears of corn wheeling freshly round about. It was enough that they helped the cow in labor, or ferreted the rats from under the barn, or broke the back of the rabbit with a sharp knock of the hand. So much warmth and generating and pain and death did they know in their blood. Earth and sky and beast and green plants, so much exchange and interchange that they had with these, that they lived full and surcharged, their senses full fed, their faces always turned to the heat of blood, staring into the sun dazed with looking toward the source of generation, unable to turn around. But the woman wanted another form of life than this, something that was not blood intimacy. Her house faced out from the farm buildings and the fields, looked out to the road and the village with the church and the hall and the world beyond. She stood to see the far-off world of cities and governments and the active scope of man, the magic land to her where secrets were made known and desires fulfilled. She faced outwards to where men moved dominant and creative, having turned their back on the pulsing heat of creation. And with this behind them, were set out to discover what was beyond, to enlarge their own scope and range and freedom, whereas the Brangwyn men faced inwards to the teeming life of creation which poured unresolved into their veins. Looking out, as she must, from the front of her house toward the activity of man and the world at large, while her husband looked out to the back at the sky and the harvest and the beast and land, she strained her eyes to see what man had done in fighting outwards to knowledge. She strained in her to hear how he uttered himself in his conquest. Her deepest desire hung on the battle that she heard far off being waged on the edge of the unknown. She also wanted to know and to be of the fighting host. At home, even so near as Kosathe, was the vicar who spoke the other magic language and had the other finer bearing, both of which she could perceive but could not never attain to. The vicar moved in worlds beyond where her own menfolk existed beyond where her own menfolk existed. Did she not know her own menfolk, fresh, slow, full-built men, masterful enough but easy, native to the earth, lacking outwardness and range of motion, whereas the vicar, dark and dry and small beside her husband, had yet a quickness and a range of being that made Brangwen, in his large geniality, seem dull and local. She knew her husband, but the vicar's nature was that which passed beyond her knowledge. As Brangwen had power over cattle, so the vicar had power over her husband. What was it in the vicar that raised him above the common men as man is raised above a beast? She craved to know. She craved to achieve this higher being, if not in herself, then in her children. That which makes a man strong, even if he be little and frail in body, just as any man is little and frail beside a bull and yet stronger than the bull, what was it? It was not money, nor power, nor position. What power had the vicar over Tom Brangwen? None. Yet stripped them and set them on a desert island, and the vicar was the master. His soul was master of the other man's. And why? Yeah, battery's going. I may run out entirely. Uh, and why? She decided it was a question of knowledge. So, I'm still playing with my charger. Um, <laughs> I apologize for these uh, unprofessional interruptions. Also, that I can't edit them out because I have absolutely no editing skill. But hopefully you heard a lot of cool stuff in that passage that you can write about. Uh, certainly there is some. And let's, let's talk about it. I'm going to read through it um, at least until my battery dies and I figure out this whole plug-in issue. Um, and... Uh, We'll see, we'll see what we get from it. So uh, I just read it to you, but now we're going to read it with analysis. And hopefully you see the things that I see as I go through here. Remember, the AP, the goal of AP is that you can um, read on multiple levels. You can read for enjoyment, sure, and really understand complex things in that way. But you also need to be able to read uh, for analysis, 
um, and and think about it in terms of this was written by an author. The author is trying to manipulate and control his reader into feeling certain things and thinking certain ways. Um, he has a theme or a lesson. Every author is a teacher. What is that theme? What is that lesson? What's coming across here? Uh, so hopefully you're really starting to, to be able to understand all of that uh, and be able to shift seamlessly between those levels. So let's go. It was enough for the men that the earth heaved and opened its furrow to them that the wind blew to dry the wet wheat and set the young ears of corn wheeling freshly about it. This is some very sexual language, you know. Um, we're talking about the men, um, they're farmers, but somehow this farming imagery is um, disturbingly sexual. So the land is feminized and the farmers are, are plowing and raising and growing and, you know, like all of that kind of stuff. This goes back to like ancient Greece and agrarian cultures in general that have this sort of language. Um, you know, the fertility goddess is always a goddess, uh, mother earth, that sort of thing, um, plowing and planting, being sexual. So, okay, I see that. Um, let's see. It was enough that they helped the cow in labor. Hey, there's the birth immediately after the sex image. Or ferreted the rats from under the barn and broke the back of the rabbit with a sharp knock of the hand. That's very violent. But hey, we just went with sex, birth, death. So this is a cycle that continues. And clearly the men are involved in this cycle. So much warmth and generating and pain and death. Hey, it's like a recap of what I just said. Um, did they know in their blood, so they're associated with blood, earth and sky. These are very, very primal things, blood, earth, and sky, and beast and green plants. So much exchange and interchange they had with these that they lived full and surcharge, their senses full. Hey, we just rep repeated the word full twice. So the men are full. They're filled up with physicality, um, you know, like the physical experience of sex, birth, living, dying, that kind of a thing. Full and surcharge, their senses full, their senses. They're all about the five senses, what they can sense with their bodies. Um, their faces always turn to the heat of the blood. There's that word again, blood. Staring into the sun, dazed with looking toward the source of gener generation, unable to turn around, unable. I think that word's interesting. Um, but the woman, hey, this tells us, just by the way it's structured, that this is a juxtaposition, right? So we have the men and the description of the men. The woman is in opposition to the men. We're supposed to pay attention to the way the woman's characterized, so we probably want to look at the characterization of the woman as opposed or in opposition to the characterization of her husband, the Brangwen men. But the woman wanted another form of life than this, something that was not blood intimacy. So she's opposed to the blood um, she's opposed to maybe the lifestyle of the farmers. Her house faced out from the farm. Now, this is an opposition to inward. All those men were looking inward. Her house faces outwards from the farm buildings and fields. Looked out to the, and that's a personification of the house. Looked out to the road and the village with church and hall and the world beyond. So she is outward looking as opposed to inward looking. Um, she stood to see the far off world of cities and governments the active scope of man, the magic land. I think that word magic is probably useful to her, whose secrets, she's interested in understanding secrets, were made known and desires fulfilled. She has desires. So her desires are for a wider world than rural farmland. She's looking at London. She's looking at uh, the major cities and population centers and the bigger world, whereas her husband is interested in the workings of the farm. She faced outward to where men moved dominant and creative, um, having turned their back on the pulsing heat of creation and with this behind them were set out to discover what was beyond to enlarge their own scope and range and freedom scope range range is a farming word freedom this is the opposite to the farm a farm is designed to pen things in to pen animals in it's almost like her husband is penned in like the animals um, into the farm and she wants to be free she wants to escape she wants to be beyond that and escape to her is, is magical and it has to do with um, secrets and desires that can only happen in the city. Whereas the Brangwen men, uh, continuing the juxtaposition, uh, faced inwards to the teeming life of creation which poured unresolved into their veins. Looking out, again, in and out, she must from the front of her house toward the activity of man in the world at large, whilst her husband looked out the back at the sky and harvest and beast and land and she strained her eyes to see what man had done in fighting outwards to knowledge. All right, so there's lots of focus on orientation and sight here. She's straining to see. 
um, sight and knowledge have been linked. I mean, anybody who read Oedipus knows that. We've got that word knowledge. Is this an allusion to 